For almost 30 years, Stalin ruled the Soviet Union, doing anything he needed to achieve his goals. Anyone who got in his way was destroyed. He was devil. He was genius devil, but devil. 20 million Soviet citizens died at the hand of Joseph Stalin. He was absolute ruler for 25 years, a Bolshevik czar. He craved power. He never could have enough power. The system of terror was essential to Stalinism. Terror was, was continuous, continuous, continuous. I was asleep, and all of a sudden, I woke up and I saw uh, strangers in military uniform in our apartment. We know that he signed uh, a number of orders to execute people uh, who were totally innocent. At the end of the 19th century, Russia was the largest country on Earth. From the fertile fields of the Ukraine to the frozen tundra of Siberia, this ancient land was big enough to hold the United States and Europe within its borders. The ruler of this vast empire was Tsar Nicholas II, the shy, awkward inheritor of the 300-year-old Romanov dynasty. He and his family lived a privileged and genteel life. Typical of the European royalty, they actually were. Nine out of ten Russians, however, lived in villages, eking out a living from the land. In 1879, two of these peasants gave birth to a son, Joseph Jugashvili, later to be known as Joseph Stalin. Joseph's mother was a maid and washerwoman and a devout Orthodox Christian. His father, of whom no photos remain, worked occasionally as a shoemaker and was a violent alcoholic. The family lived in this shack in the tiny village of Guri in the Russian province of Georgia. His father was incredibly poor, very poor man. And he had terrible passion to drink. He beat wife. He beat her cruelly, violently. And so this violence come in his heart from his childhood. He was an awkward looking boy. Young Joseph's face was pockmarked by smallpox, and a childhood accident left one arm shorter than the other. And he stopped growing at five feet, four inches. He was quite small. He, he liked to have wedge shoes, make him sort of a bit higher. And he had a very dark, sinister look, particularly his eyes. They're always described as yellow or tigerish eyes. Uh, th that was his main impression given. He was a good student, good enough to enroll in a seminary school. But the priesthood was the last thing on Joseph Jugashvili's mind. Fifty years earlier, Karl Marx had written of a world where the workers, not the aristocracy, controlled the destiny of a nation. In Russia, these ideas were turned into a political movement, Bolshevism, by Vladimir Lenin, a man the Tsar's police thought dangerous enough to exile to Siberia. This excitement drew the shoemaker's son like a magnet, and at 19, he left school to join the cause. He was not much of a theorist, but he was militant and committed, even masterminding a bank robbery to fill the party coffers in 1907. He was a man of action, which Lenin admired. When Lenin first met Stalin, he wrote to someone, I've met a magnificent Georgian. And it's clear that he saw in Stalin at that time the kind of person he hoped to attract to a movement that was then primarily a movement of intellectuals. That is a person with working class peasant origins, not an intellectual, but a person who, as Russians say, was very de la voie, could get things done. He certainly saw himself as a fighter, and in 1912 he began using the name Stalin, which means man of steel. 
But it was difficult to make any progress because Stalin and his comrades kept getting arrested by the Tsar's police. They languished in exile for years in houses like this one in distant Siberia. He was in prison many times. He was in exile endless time. And prison and exile would be for him as native home. And he will make prison and exile like native home for millions of his citizens in future. The exiles would soon get their chance. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Ferdinand was shot by a Serbian nationalist in Sarajevo. World War I broke out a month later, and Tsar Nicholas sent millions of Russian troops to fight in his name. The men marched off proudly, but their enthusiasm soon sank as fierce German fighting decimated the Tsarist forces. Four million Russians were killed, wounded, or missing within a year. The surviving soldiers resented dying for someone else's cause, and morale plummeted. They refused to go to battle. They defied their officers. They deserted the army and went home to the village and burned down the landlord's manor house. And when later someone said to Lenin, who voted for the revolution, he said, the soldier, the peasant soldier voted, voted with his feet. He deserted. In February 1917, a crowd of angry citizens and disaffected soldiers took over St. Petersburg. The Tsar knew his government couldn't stand, and he abdicated a few days later, ending the 300-year-old Romanov dynasty. A provisional government then briefly shared power with the revolutionaries, but in April, Lenin came back to Russia demanding a completely proletarian victory. The people need peace, he said, and they give you war, hunger, no food, and the land remains with the landholders. In October, his Bolsheviks swept away the moderate government. It was a momentous victory. But, except for writing a few editorials, Joseph Stalin was not a part of the action. Later, he would have Soviet historians invent a heroic role for him. He would make his mark in the next and bloodiest phase of the revolution, the Civil War. From 1918 to 1920, counter-revolutionaries known as the Whites fought to regain power from the Bolshevik Reds. The fighting spared no one, and those that lived through it would never forget it. I was frightened. All the time I was frightened. Because all the time different troops came. The Kiev was occupied. First there was a revolution. Then the, there was a nationalist government. Then came the Reds and occupied Kiev. Then came the Whites and reoccupied Kiev. The fighting was going on. There were two feelings, fear and feeling of hunger. Lenin's Bolsheviks now became military commanders. Leon Trotsky, the brilliant orator and theorist, was made war commissar. Stalin was given the title Commissar of Nationalities and was sent into the field to enforce the party line. It was a role that suited him well. War, and particularly civil war, brings the warfare personalities to the fore. And Stalin, already during the Civil War, begins to become the leader in Moscow of these warfare personalities, these can-do tough guys who don't really want to debate the dialectics of Marxism, who don't really want to talk about the nuances of class struggle, but men for whom class struggle meant the fist. In 1918, Trotsky sent him a detachment of army specialists. Stalin, who distrusted the trained military, imprisoned some of the men on a boat which then sank under mysterious circumstances. He had many of the others just shot. When someone said this might be a problem at headquarters, the Man of Steel reportedly replied, death solves all problems. No man, no problem. 
for Lenin, Stalin was a real revolutionary. Uh, Lenin knew that Trotsky wanted to be a real revolutionary. Trotsky wanted to be cruel. Trotsky, Trotsky wanted to be a real executor for revolutionary enemies. But Stalin was cruel. Stalin was able to hate really. In the end, this ruthlessness would turn Lenin away from his protege. But for now, this small band of men would start pulling Russia into their vision of the world. And this world would soon be dominated by a single one of them, Joseph Stalin. Like most young men, Joseph Stalin fell in love and married during his early years. His first wife, Yekaterina Svanidze, died a few years after they were married. Their one child, Yakov, was left with her family. Stalin wouldn't see the boy again until he was a grown man. At the age of 39, Joseph Stalin married again, this time to Nadezhda Alaluyeva the 17-year-old daughter of two friends from his exile days. They had two children, Svetlana and Vasily. But Stalin's attention was focused on matters of state. The Bolsheviks got rid of the last of the white forces in 1920. Now they would remake Russia as the first communist state. Marx had called religion the opiate of the masses, so the Bolsheviks set out to eliminate it. Churches were desecrated, and priests openly mocked. I believe the most terrible thing in Bolsheviks' empire that they were atheistic empire. They finished Russian religion, and the result was terrible. They stopped to be people. They became crowd incredible crowd. Food was scarce since the Bolsheviks had seized every scrap of grain during the war. Where were the food and peace Lenin had promised? This discontent erupted in the naval base of Kronstadt in the Gulf of Finland when a group of sailors who had fought alongside the Reds in the Civil War began demanding food and political freedom. Trotsky sent in the Red Army and slaughtered the resistors. It was now clear the popular revolution was over. A few thousand Bolsheviks had absolute control of a nation of millions. In 1922, Comrade Stalin was given an important job in this new ruling class, running the party secretariat. On the one hand, it was just to keep the books. Where were the party members? Who were they? But it also was responsible for appointing people to administrative positions in the party. And like any good ward politician, he appointed people who seemed to be loyal to him, who thought as he thought, and he removed people he didn't like. His following was growing, but to get more power, he knew he'd have to outmaneuver the party leadership. After Lenin, the most powerful man in the party was Trotsky, who had emerged from the war a popular hero. So in 1923, Stalin formed an anti-Trotsky alliance with fellow Politburo members Kamenev and Zinoviev. Like all his alliances, this one wouldn't last. It isn't that they really liked him, but they were still taken in by him. It was an extraordinary way in which Somehow they all find themselves working with him in 10 years later in the Politburo and they still haven't understood he's going to kill them. On Stalin's 70th birthday in 1949, pictures of the great leader were projected into the sky over Moscow. His all-knowing, all-seeing eye was everywhere. But his omniscience couldn't keep time from catching up to him. After a long feast on February 28th, 1953, Joseph Stalin had a paralyzing stroke. Over the next few days, he slowly suffocated to death. He died on the morning of March 5th. 
The funeral was an orgy of grief. Soviets couldn't imagine life without their God and Father. I was in Moscow, only about uh, four blocks from the place where Stalin's body was laying after his death. A lot of people were crying, and they were crying because when you live in paternalistic society, you are raised to believe that he makes all the decisions for you, and without him, the nation will fall apart. Stalin's eventual successor, Nikita Khrushchev, would bring a wave of honesty to Soviet politics. But Stalin's memory would not go quietly. In 1956, Nikita Khrushchev gave an extraordinary speech at a closed session of the 20th Party Congress. He said that while Stalin had been a great leader, he had committed terrible crimes against the Soviet people. His listeners were stunned and some were angry. For a lot of people, it was the beginning of the end of belief in the system because if the man who ruled Russia for almost uh, 30 years could be so wrong and so maniacal and so horrible and so bloodthirsty, what did that say about all of them? who had lived under his rule and had been a part of building this system. Leonid Brezhnev and his successors went back to the silence of the past. But in 1985, when Mikhail Gorbachev became general secretary, he vowed to break the stranglehold that Stalinism had left behind. His reforms pulled the Soviet Union away from the secrecy and terror of the past. They also broke the country apart. For many years, I thought that the system that we inherited could be improved. But that was an illusion. The Stalinist model could not be improved because it was imposed by the Bolsheviks on our country, a system that assumed a monopoly of power, a dictatorship of one party, repression, coercion, the suppression of political and cultural freedom. It is very difficult to go beyond, to move away from that system. In fact, some want to move back to it. Today, there is a resurgence of nostalgia for the strong hand of Joseph Stalin's reign. I'm proud because during the Stalin era, our country became one of the most developed. In what way? We were respected. No, nobody was afraid of us. After the revolution of 1917, the country was revived. It became industrialized. We believed in the future. We had hope. We had belief for a better life. In Georgia, Joseph Stalin's birthplace has again opened up as a museum. In a chaotic world, Stalinism is fondly remembered by some as a time of clarity and strength. It's a legacy that won't easily fade.